In this session, we will um, continue with what we started on the fiqh of polygamy in light of kitab and sunnah. In the first um, session, we were explaining or just laying down some basic principles with regards to polygamy, with regards to some of the do's and don'ts, um, some of the doubts, uh, some of the fallacies and uh, ambiguities and misunderstandings and improper applications and practices of polygamy by Muslims and by non-Muslims and by people who, uh, without any doubt, are munafiqeen. Not Muslims, but they say they're Muslims with their tongues, but in their hearts they neither believe in the law nor in the last day. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all from nifaq. Amin. Those who wish to destroy Islam and attack Islam and the Islamic Sharia and the Quran al kareem and the Hanith of the Prophet seven from within. Wa li'adha billah. Um, so before we move on to this second part, we just want to mention some uh, brief wisdoms behind polygamy. Okay, there, uh, There's nothing in the Sharia that is legislated and laid down except that there's a divine purpose behind it. Except that there is a ultimate wisdom, okay, and there is a secret in it, whether we know of it, or whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of it and explains it to us, or whether it's hidden to us, whether our weak, uh, short human minds can uh, ponder upon it or not, but we believe wholeheartedly that it is something that is based off of ultimate wisdom, not just wisdom, but hujjatun baligha. As Allah Azza wa Jal has said in the Quran, قُلْ فَلِلَّهِ الْحُجَّةُ الْبَالِغَةِ فَلَوْ شَاءَ لَهَدَاكُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ Allah the Exalted tells us what is translated <clears throat> to mean, say, to Allah is al-hujjah al-baligah, is the ultimate, most superior argument and proof, not argument, but the hujjah, authority, okay? And if Allah had willed, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he surely he would have guided all of you. If Allah willed, all of you would be guided. Everyone will be a Muslim. Everyone say, La ilaha Muhammad Rasulullah and accept polygamy and the rest of the religion. But that's not how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted it to be. So therefore, everything that Allah legislates is based off of divine, ultimate wisdom. And this is a very important point for the Muslims to understand for every aspect of the religion. Salat, zakat, all right, fasting, hajj, jihad in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's cause. Why? Why three rakat for Maghrib? Why four for al Isha? And so on and so forth. Okay? Some of those things we know about. And some of those things we don't know about. And it isn't for the human being. A slave. To question. And to contest his master. It's not for a slave. Do we realize this brothers and sisters that we are slaves? Do you know what the term slave means? You don't own anything. You have no property. You're a slave. Your job. And your task. Is to please and to serve your master. And it is not for you to think and to question and contest what your master tells you to do or allows you to do because you're a slave. So this concept of being a servant of God is very important uh, in understanding polygamy and anything else from the religion of Islam. Whenever we read the Quran al we find often that when Allah uh, mentions a ruling, uh, He always ends, or not always, but many times, He ends that verse by saying, Inna Allah azizun hakim. Inna Allah kana azizun hakima. Okay, that Allah Azza wa is Aziz, He's mighty, powerful, and He's Hakim, He's wise. So everything Allah legislates is based off of power and strength, and it's based off of wisdom. It's not based off of something being weak and feeble. It's not based off something being done out of foolishness, but it's something that is beneficial, something that is helpful, something that is uh, the most wholesome thing that a slave can possibly achieve in this worldly life. So therefore, uh, the concept of polygamy, that's the general wisdom behind it. Allah legislated it. Subhanahu Azza wa Jalla. And from another aspect, there are some things that we do know about, uh, such as women being more than men. There being more women than there are men. Okay? Such as uh, the need of a man to have more than one woman. Okay? Such as the concept of women who need husbands, who need protectors, who need people to provide for them, but for one reason or another, whether it's age, or whether it's because of an illness or uh, 
about them being a widow or whatever the case may be. For one reason or another, we said, wars, one reason or another, they wouldn't normally have that much of a chance of getting married and finding a husband on their own without another wife. In other words, not all women, but there are sometimes, even in this current, uh, in the, the, the world we live in today, there are some women that, uh, in some cultures, in many cultures, they wouldn't be able to be the first wife for one reason or another. They just wouldn't be able to, okay, on the market of looking for a husband. But to be a second wife, alhamdulillah, or a third wife, alhamdulillah. And this doesn't mean that it's a bad thing to be a co-wife. That's another misunderstanding, okay? This doesn't mean that it's just a, an alternative or just a substitute, as many people think, men and women. They think that it's a negative thing to be a co-wife. I don't want my daughter to have marry a man that has one wife. Why not? If he treats your daughter kindly, if he respects her, if he loves her, if he honors her, he provides for her, why not? What's the problem? Okay, you may uh, marry your daughter off to a man and she's the first wife of that man and he may beat her, curse her, disrespect her, mistreat her, cheat on her. Which are you pleased with? And this is a very important concept for the Muslims to have common sense. What do you want for your children? What do you want for your daughter? Do you want her just to say she's the first wife and the only wife? Or do you want your children to be happy? The concept of being stingy is a very sick concept. And it's an illness that is widespread among many human beings, many men. They're very stingy when it comes to their children. Uh, most parents, they don't look for the happiness of their children, of their daughters. They look for their own happiness. You cannot marry this person. Why not? Because we don't like him. Because it's going to give our family a bad name. Because, 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 because. But she's happy. She's pleased. He's religious. He has good character. No, that's not enough. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help the Muslims with regards to the Ameen. And there are some sisters who feel that uh, they'll say, I'll allow my husband to get another wife. He can have another wife if she's a divorcee. If she's older. She has to be 10 years older than me. If I'm 30 and she's 40, it's okay. Okay? She has to have children. She cannot look as pretty as I do. She cannot uh, be in as, as, as good a shape as I'm in. And so on and so forth. She must be a refugee from a country. She, she must be a widow. Her husband was killed in this war, in this battle. If that's not the case, no, you can't go out and marry a, a, a girl younger than me. A woman that's younger than me. That's not a condition. That is not a condition of polygamy, but we said that it's from the wisdoms. There's no doubt about that. Um, and there are many other wisdoms behind a man having more than one wife, such as children. Okay, it comes a time in which a woman cannot have children. That's clear. And that goes back to what we just explained. Some sisters, they say, well, if I can't have children, then you can get another wife. If I'm sick, then you can get another wife. If not, no. La, even if you can have children, there lies no doubt. There is a means of uh, uh, assistance. A woman may not always want to be pregnant. A woman may not always want to be breastfeeding. And many women, they complain about this. Especially when it comes to Ramadan. I have three Ramadans that I missed. Four Ramadans that I missed. Do I have to feed and make up the days? Make up the days and feed? Just make up the days? What do I do? I was pregnant one year. That's nine months. Okay? Then she breastfed the child for at least two years. That's three Ramadans that she's missed. Then after the third year, oh, she's pregnant again. Now she's going to miss another three Ramadans and so on and so forth. Next you know she hasn't fasted in years. And that's burdensome upon a woman. So a woman, she wants to fast. Or let's say a woman, she just wants to be with her husband. She wants to spend more time with her husband. She doesn't want to be babysitting children. This child pulling on her leg. This child on her hip. This child, this child. She wants to have more time and more romance with her husband. Okay. But the husband says, I want more children. I want to have more girls. I want to have more sons. I want to make more Muslims. No, I don't want no more children. Okay, then it's a problem. Or the doctor says that you shouldn't have any more children. You have high-risk pregnancies. It's harmful upon your body, so on and so forth. A man, he gets another wife. And so on and so forth. There are many wisdoms uh, behind a man having more than one wife. One of our mashayikh here in al Medina, one day we were sitting with him and we were discussing the concept of polygamy. And we asked him about, you know, uh, what is the custom and the culture of the people of Medina with regards to having more than one wife? And the sheikh wasn't originally from Medina. He was originally from Qasim. So he started telling us about, you know, some of the customs of some of the Arab people here and some of the different tribes and how things were and how things are. And he said that there was a time, not too long ago, that a woman would be happy for having a co-wife. She was happy. It was a blessing from Allah for her to have a co-wife. And that's because 
Now she had someone that could help her out, that could assist her and share some of the responsibilities, some of the difficulties and some of the hardships of life. He says that it's not like, or back then it wasn't like how things are now. Everything's made, everything's fast, everything is there. You know, you snap your fingers and you get what you want. No. A person had to, for basic needs, such as milk. There was no supermarket that you went and you get a gallon of milk. You had to go out and you had to milk the animal yourself. Okay? Whether the milk is boiled, whether you drink it fresh, you pasteurize or not, you had to do that. You wanted honey, you had to go get honey. Okay, uh, preparing food, cooking, cleaning, serving your husband. Those things took time, and it took effort. Let alone the fact, okay, just a man's sexual desires. Let's say a man has very high level, a very high sex drive, and he wants to be with his wife all of the time, but she doesn't. Okay, washing, making gusul, her hair, whatever the case may be. She was happy that she got a second wife, because, a co-wife, because now the responsibility was lifted off of her just a little bit. It was someone that she could be friends with and talk with and they could help each other out to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost and serve their husband. And so on and so forth. He's asked for today, he says, then life is so difficult, life is so complicated, life is so expensive. He says, then there the people that used to uh, get uh, have more than wives, those men, normally, he says, here and there you find them. Okay, but no matter what the case, whether this or whether that, we say it is still legislation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, a piece of advice is never to blame the system, but blame the practitioners of the system. Islam is perfect. The Sharia is perfect. Allah's rules and His words are perfect. But the slaves are imperfect. Their understanding is imperfect. Their application is imperfect. But the legislation of polygamy is a blessing. Okay? It's a blessing. And there are many other wisdoms. Those uh, we will suffice ourselves with right now and right here. There is a book, um, that I book uh, that I bought maybe about five years ago called Ahkam al-Qasim Bayna Zawjat. It was called Rulings of uh, Al-Qasim. Rulings of Dividing Your Time and Dividing Your Nights Between Your Wives uh, by uh, Khalid al-Mushaykah. If uh, my memory serves me correctly, the author of the book. He put in the book the most important rulings with regards to a man having more than one wife. Okay, And there are other rulings too. There are other rulings pertaining to polygamy, but these are the most important rulings that are problemsome for people with regards to what to do, with regards to having more than one wife, spending time, so on and so forth. So therefore, um, the khatima of the book is a summary of the book. The author, he mentions 38 points that he talked about in the book in detail. We're going to read this summary and try to get some light from it, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And before we go on, one of the most commonly qu uh, posed questions, because now we want to talk about some of the actual rulings of polygamy. One of the most commonly posed questions is, do I have to ask my wife's permission to get another wife? Or some brothers, they say, do I have to tell my first wife? Should I tell my first wife? So on and so forth. We say that if a man has to ask his wife's permission to get another wife, then he shouldn't have more than one wife. Anytime you have to ask her permission, to do that, something's already not right, okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not place the allowance, the permissibility of polygamy in the hand of the woman. That's not something that was given to her by her Lord and her maker, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Divorce is not in her hand, let alone him marrying another woman, okay? So the concept of seeking permission, that word in itself is very problematic, now, a woman, she's not okay with it. I don't want a second wife. Okay, fine. I don't reject the legislation. I believe in it wholeheartedly. But me, I don't want to live in a polygamous marriage. That's fine. That's her own choice. That's her own discretion. Before you get married, those things need to be spoken about. Or whatever the case may be. You talk about it with her. But that word, asking permission, that's crazy, as we would say. Do you have to tell your first wife? Or should you tell your first wife? Well, I mean, this woman is your wife. You live with her. You sleep with her. You eat with her. You drink with her. You walk with her. You talk with her. She's supposed to be your partner in life. The woman that you love, you take care of. Now you're going to have a whole another relationship, a whole another woman, a whole another amount of days and nights, or whatever the case may be, with another woman. Um, I definitely think it would be a good idea. And it wouldn't hurt for her to know that you have another wife, that's it's very important. There's no doubt about that, okay? Now, some brothers, they have second wives, 
and it's hidden. First wife doesn't know. In another country, another city, he works, he goes there, he goes there, so on and so forth. Uh, well, I mean, as the, uh, you know, if, you're, if you have to hide the fact that you have another wife from your first wife, then there's already something problematic with regards to her and polygamy, your treatment of her, your, your guy's relationship. Many women, they complain about, my husband doesn't spend enough time with me already as it is. Well, and now he wants to get another wife. He works, he's a workaholic, and then he wants to get another wife. He works two jobs, huh? 50 hours out the week, and he wants to get another wife. Or he can't pay the bills here, and he wants to get another wife, so on and so on and so on and so forth. So the point is that there's already problems. So now you're going to go out and get another wife and not tell her. Okay. Haram, halal, whatever the case may be. If your first wife finds out about that second relationship, what's going to happen? So the believer has to be wise, and he has to think far. Okay, as the Arabs say, this praising the short-sighted man, it says, They say, so-and-so doesn't look past the tip of his nose. So-and-so doesn't look past his nose. In other words, you have to look at what's going to happen. Very important. Uh, uh, another concept is that if you want to get a second wife, um, it doesn't mean that you're displeased with the first wife. As many women feel. Uh, many women, I would say, in my humble opinion, most women, they feel this. That if my husband wants a second wife, it's automatic. It's an automatic. It automatically means that I'm ugly, or I'm fat, or I'm too skinny, or too big, or too tall, or too short, too light, too dark. He doesn't like me. I've had children, so therefore my body has changed. Okay? I have stretch marks, um, so on and so forth. The rest of the things that people, you know, I breastfed my child now, um, etc. So they automatically get this, this understanding that something is wrong with me. I'm not attractive to my husband. I don't turn him on as much. My husband doesn't look at me. He doesn't consider me to be sexy enough. That's why he has to get another woman. Okay? And we say that, that doesn't always, that's not always the case. And that's not as all, that is not always the uh, correct understanding. Okay? Rather, a husband can have a first wife. Or his first wife, I mean, pleased with her. He can please with her religion, how she looks, physically, everything. He loves her. He's attracted to her, but he just wants another wife. It's something that's permissible. Okay? It's something that is permissible. All right? Now, uh, the bottom line, whether you like it, whether a woman is jealous, it is Allah's sharia. And you must accept it if you call yourself a Muslim. Okay? So, therefore, it's not a binding condition that just because a man gets another wife, that the first wife is bad. And he's not pleased with it. Sometimes that is the case, yes. Many times that is the case. And that's another concept. Is that if you're having major problems with your first wife, it's not always necessarily a good idea to get another wife. Because it's going to complicate the problems. You're going to snowball effect those problems. are going to get bigger and larger. And some of them may become irreparable. So that's another concept. But from another aspect, one may say, rather a man getting another wife, perhaps it will stifle some of those problems. Perhaps they'll get over some of those problems, okay? And that's another means of wisdom of polygamy, whereas uh, the concept of ungratefulness. Allah Azza has told us in the Quran Kareem that man is ungrateful. Allah told us in the Quran that man in San is kafur. He's a terrible ingrate. He's a wretched ingrate, okay? Then we also have the concept of women being ungrateful to their husbands. As the Messenger of Allah والسلام, told the women in the hadith that's, in, that's collected in the Sahih, when he asked them to give sadaqah, he asked them to give charity on the day of the Eid. He says, Tasadakna. He says, Give charity. He says, Because I've been shown that you will be the majority of the denizens of the fire. And he went on to explain, at once he was asked, Why are we, why will we be in the fire so much? Huh? He says it's based off of kufr, disbelief in Allah. He says, Takfurun al Ashir. Okay, He says, You are ungrateful to good treatment. You do not respect, you do not appreciate your husband's kind treatment of you. Okay? The Prophet said, he told us that if a man does something for a woman his entire life, and then he does something that's wrong, something that's bad, he slips up, he makes a mistake, he doesn't give her what she wants, how she wants it, when she wants it, how exactly how she wants it. And she says, I didn't see anything good from you. 
the hadith says, Waliyadu Billah. The hadith says, I've never seen no good from you. And this is something that I don't think there's any human being, man or woman, Muslim or Christian or Jew, except that they will acknowledge this is a this is a reality. This is a truth. This is a truth. Okay? When a woman becomes angry, when she becomes upset, when a husband doesn't do something, how she wants it, she says, You don't do anything for me. You never help me out. You're never there for me. You don't pay no bills. You don't take care of nothing. You never uh, take me out. You're not romantic. You never sleep with me. And the list goes on. So this is an unfortunate characteristic of a woman. So therefore, the concept of a woman having a man who comes home every night, every day, they're together all the time, there lies no doubt that is, this is a means of ungratefulness. And it's a means of lack of appreciation. And the more you have of a thing, there lies no doubt the average human being, the less he appreciates and the less he values that thing. That's well known. No one can reject this. This is common reason. The more you have something and the more easy the access is to that thing, the less appreciation there is. So therefore, the concept of if a woman wishes to disrespect her husband or to censure him or whatever the case may be, uh, there lies no doubt if he has another wife, there's another household that he's going to, there's another woman that he's caring for and he's loving and she's cooking for him and this and that. Uh, no matter how wretched the woman may be or miserable or whatever the case may be, at least she's going to think twice before she says something to anger him or to disrespect him or get on his bad side. Whether he's right or whether she's right, regardless. But there lies no doubt the smart woman, she's going to think twice. Like, wait a second, I have to be a little more careful now. I have to show him a little more respect now. He has another wife now, and this is another wisdom of polygamy, let alone the concept of uh, competition, okay? And there is sometimes which, uh, in Islam which competition is a good thing, okay? And sometimes it's a bad thing. But the concept of a woman being the best wife that she can be, okay? Looking the best, acting the best, having the best religion, cooking the best, and so pleasing him uh, sexually in the best way, there lies no doubt that is a good thing. And the more, as we said, the more a person has of a thing and the easier and the longer it is, there lies no doubt that a human being becomes complacent and you become stagnant, okay? When, just look at you, when you first get married to your husband, there lies no doubt how you treat him in the first couple of months, first couple of weeks, is not like after 10 or 15 or 20 years. It's different. Of course, you love your husband. Of course, things grow, things mature, they age, you become even better. But there are certain sparks and certain things that you used to do that they're not done anymore. Or we may say, a woman may lower her guard. And certain things that she was too shy to do in front of her husband, or embarrassed, or she felt ashamed of seeing her husband doing, and, or her husband comes home and she's in this, she looks like this, and, is, and so on and so forth. As time goes on, she loses those things. But when a man is coming from his second wife, or going to a second wife, Okay, the believing woman, there lies no doubt, she has the concept of, she's, he's going to another woman. He's coming from another woman. I need to look in the best fashion. My hair should be done. I should be dressed in the best way. I should be smelling the best way. His food, his meal should be prepared. His bath, and so on and so forth. And a lot of times, men make excuses, yes, and women they make excuses. I can't do this because of the children. I can't do that because of finances. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. You want me to do like this, but I can't. Okay, possible. It's possible. However, uh, the successful spouse, man or woman, is the one who tries to remove excuses and tries to please his or her spouse in the best way possible. There's no excuse. There's no I can't. Okay? So therefore, when a woman, um, she has another wife or two wives, and they're all competing with her, and there lies no doubt from the jealousy of a woman and sometimes from the malice of a woman, and from the venom of a woman, or the other Bilal, okay, is that she's going to try to become number one. He's been married to this woman for five years, for 10 years, for 15 years. She comes along and she says, well, I want to take her spot. I want him to love me the best. I want him to be the most attracted to me, and so on and so forth. So there is going to build a natural environment of uh, staying sharp. Because there's this woman out here, unfortunately, she's trying to take your husband's heart. It's a reality. It's a reality, okay? No sugar on top. This is a reality. So therefore, you have to be the best wife that you can be. You have to have the thing that he comes home that they cannot provide for him. 
Okay, and that's another concept of marriage, let alone polygamy, is that when a man enters his home, especially after working, coming home from traveling, from working, from doing things, he should come home to serenity, to tranquility. He should come home to peace. Everything should be nice, should be smelling nice, should be looking nice. It shouldn't be why and this and that and no, you forgot. That's not the attribute of the righteous wife. And many women, unfortunately... As we've explained in other classes, they allow the shaitan to get them to make excuses. They make excuses. And excuses are not going to work because those excuses are from shaitan. Okay? Uh, and we can look on the opposite side. A husband that provides for his wife, he doesn't make excuses. Uh, I didn't get any work. Um, uh, I didn't... Things didn't... No. The bills have to be paid. The, light has, the lights have to be on. It's cold. The heat has to be on. It's hot in the summertime. The air conditioning has to be on. There's no excuses. Just like you won't accept certain excuses from your husband, you cannot accept certain excuses. He shouldn't accept certain excuses from you. So there's another wisdom of polygamy is that sometimes it uh, minimizes ungratefulness. Sometimes it minimizes ungratefulness because now you cannot do what you want to do. You cannot say what you want to say to your husband because there are other people involved. And as a reality, and I don't think anybody of sense is going to reject that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. Khair, inshallah. So these are all misunderstandings that many people have about polygamy um, and practices about polygamy. Uh, and that's another thing too, Akhi, for the brother. If you want to get another wife, then yani, you have to realize there are certain things that are going to change. A woman has natural feelings and emotions. Don't think that everything is going to be the same and peachy and sweet in the beginning. Don't think that. No. She has her feelings. She has to accept it. And most importantly, she has to make jihad enough. She's literally fighting herself to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To submit to you after Allah azawajal and accept this. Polygamy is not from the American culture. It's not from Western culture. It's not from modern culture. She's watching the television, this movie, the cartoons. As a brother said to me once in the masjid. He says one of the reasons why our women don't want to accept polygamy in America is because of Disney. That's what he said. He says because of Disney. And at the end of the movie, it's always what? It's always the hero, the strong man with his princess. Okay? In the Western, they always ride off into the sunset. Two. Just it, man and woman. So the whole concept of movies and the, the, the culture that a movie creates, it's already instilled in her not to have more than one, not to have a co-wife. So she's fighting, she's fighting her nafs, yachi. She's literally fighting herself. She's trying. She's at arms with her own nafs. So the least you could do, Yaqi, the least you could do is make things easy for her. The least you can do is have hikmah, have wisdom. Okay? You don't have to... Uh, and we know that it's permissible, as it says in the hadith, for a man to lie to his wife and a woman to lie to her husband. But what about a different one exactly what's meant by lying? Is it meant indirect expressions or actual lying? Al-Muhim, the hadith says lying. Kedhib. In other words, it's permissible for a man to lie to his wife not to break her feelings, not to hurt her heart. How is the food, honey? Oh, it's delicious, mashallah. It's the best I've ever had. But it's too salty or it's too sweet or you don't like it at all. But that's not what you're going to say to your wife. How do I look? What do you think I look? Oh, you look horrible. You don't say that to your wife. You look great. You look amazing. And vice versa. The husband, a woman is to say those things to her husband and to make him feel good. Okay, so if it's permissible to lie to your husband or lie to your wife, then what is the concept of not lying using wisdom? You don't. You have to make your wife feel appreciated, love. I love you. I'm attracted to you. So on and so forth. Not well. I'm just going to get another wife because I don't like the way you look. And uh, sooner after you had the children, you know you like this and like lie, achi hikma. You may marry another woman who may be more beautiful than your first wife, or maybe more religious. She may know Arabic. She may know Quran. Or whatever the case may be. But that's not what you have to tell your first wife. And if that's how you feel, that is not for you to show those emotions to your first wife. Why? Because she's already grappling with her nafs, as we said. Her kufar parents are talking to her. What? Your husband has another wife? What? Leave him. The sister at the masjid. The sister who's jealous because she doesn't have a husband. Her husband isn't religious. Her husband beats her, okay? Or husband doesn't do any things that you do for her. She's in her ear. Such and such and such and such and such and such. And such and such and such and such and such and such. Fulan and Fulan. I heard your husband is getting heaven. I heard your husband. I heard. 
She has this person in her ear, her kafir mother in her ear, shaitan is in her ear, her own nafs. All of these things going through her mind and her heart. The least you could do, Yaqi, is have hikmah, is be gentle and be wise. And it's something that cannot be explained in words. Khayran, inshallah. Now, let's get to the summary of the book. The author, he says here, بعد معايشتي لأحكام القسم بين الزوجات ظهرت لي هذه الثمار التي ألخصها فيما يلي. He says after an intense and in-depth study of the rulings of uh, dividing the time between spouses, I've come to the following conclusions. I'm going to try to be as brief and as summarized as as possible. Inshallah. He says firstly, أن القسم هو تصبيت الزوجي بين إدين defines القسوة. He says here. أنا القسم excuse me أنا القسم هو تسوية الزوج بين الزوجات في البيت وتتي ويلحق بذلك التسوية في الوقت والنفقة والهبة. He says what's meant by القسم, okay, is to be equal between all of your wives with regards to البيت وتا night time sleeping. In other words, you must be equal with your wives when it comes to spending nights. He says, and attached to this concept of spending the night with your wife are the following things. He says, one, al sexual intercourse. Two, one, nafaka, spending, providing, monetary, uh, uh, taking care of your wife through monetary means. Okay, family maintenance. He says, walhiba, and giving gifts. Giving gifts. He doesn't mean that these things are all obligatory to be equal, but what he's saying here is these are the things that this term entails. Being equal to your wives and tell these things, okay? Number two, he says, Adam, wujub al qasmi ala nabi sallam. Lakin nabi sallam al tazam al qasma bain al zujati ihsanan li ishratihin. He says, The second thing, the second fruit or benefit of my research is that the Prophet sallam was not held responsible. He was not required to give all of his wives the equal amount of nights. That was not obligatory upon him. Is obligatory upon the men who came after him, but from the special, unique things that the Prophet was given, is that he didn't have to do that. He could spend two nights with this wife and one night there, or not give this wife a night, depending on the situation. These are things which we call al khasais, khasais in Nabi Salam. Unique qualities, unique uh, virtues and merits, things that were given to the Prophet that weren't given to others, such as marrying more than four women. The Prophet was allowed to have more than four wives at one time. No man is allowed to do that, as we previously explained. The author says, however, the Prophet said him, he did this. He, he gave his wives equal nights to be kind and benevolent to them. Allahu Akbar. If it's something that isn't obligatory upon the Prophet, but he did it, why did he do it? Just to treat them kindly. So what do you think is the case with regards to Yahi? You don't have to say this. You don't have to take your wife here, but just do it. Just do it. Treat them kindly. Number three, the author says, وجوب القسم للزوجات وجوب العدل فيه وفي النفقة والهبة وعدم وجوبه في الوقت والدواعي. The third conclusion he says is that this is obligatory to share and divide the nights between your wives. He says, and it is also obligatory to be just. You have to be just in that. He says, and what's meant by that is with نفقة spending and هبة gifts. He says, but it is not obligatory. That a person equally share and divide sexual intercourse, romance, and foreplay. That's not obligatory. In other words, in simple layman terms, if a man naturally is attracted to this wife more than the other, he doesn't have to be with her as much physically. You understand the point I'm trying to get to? Whenever she has her desires and she wishes to be intimate with him, it is his responsibility to answer. It is his responsibility and obligation to physically please her sexual needs in a permissible manner to keep her chaste. Clear. That's wajib. Whatever that entails, whether it's physical strength, she wants you to work out, she wants you to gain weight, she wants you to lose weight, she wants you to have more stamina, she wishes for you to practice this act, which is a permissible act, as we've explained several times before in several classes and Q&A sessions, permissible sexual acts. And that's what she wants. You shouldn't say, oh, I don't like that. And, oh, no, I don't. That's what, that's, she's not going to be chased unless she, and that's what you need to do. Okay? Uh, but that doesn't mean that if you uh, have a, a strong physical attraction to this wife and you like to be with her intimately and, and have sexual intercourse with her so many times and so often, it doesn't have to be the same with the other wife. 
if she's pleased with, you know, once a week or whatever the case may be, then that's all which is obligatory. And you don't have to have intercourse with her the same amount of times you have intercourse with the first one. Clear, inshallah? In other words, you have two wives. The brother has two wives. Every night that he, every other night that he sees this wife, he has sexual intercourse with her. All right? When he goes to the second wife, she doesn't want any sex from him. He doesn't have to sleep with her, according to the author. Everybody clear on this? He also says, Dawa'i. Anything that leads to it, kissing, playing, whatever the case may be, if he does this more with one wife, he doesn't have to do the same with the other wife. Unless, as we said, unless what? Unless it is something that is what? Unless it's something that she wants and something that she demands, something that she needs. The author, he then goes on to say, uh, he says, number four, وجوب القسم على كل زوج مميز. He goes on to mention some other technical issues, such as a person being of age. In other words, if somebody gets married, but they're not of age of tem t temiz. We we'll leave that part out because I don't think we're dealing with people that are married that are seven, eight, and nine years old. We'll leave that out. He then says number five. يجب القسم على المريض وإذا شق لا يستأذن أزواجه أن يكون عند إحداهن فإن لم يأذن له أقام عند من عينته أو من من عينته القرعة. He says it is obligatory for the man who is ill and sick to give his wives equal amount of nights. It's obligatory upon him. He says, if it's difficult for him to go from house to house, then he should seek the permission from the other wives. Please let me stay in this wife's house until I get better. She's taking care of me. I cannot travel to the next city or the next block or whatever because I'm sick and I'm ill. If they allow him to do that, alhamdulillah. If they don't allow him to do that, and it's still difficult for him to move from house to house, then they must draw straws. Or we say rock, paper, scissors. All right? They have to uh, figure out a way to see whose house he stays in. In other words, he has three wives. He only wants to stay in one house because it's too much for moving from house to house. But they say, no, I want my time just like she has her time. So therefore, they have to do something that is going to be equal and just to figure out whose house he's going to stay in. Khair, inshallah. Number six. Either can't, and then he goes on to mention about someone who's mad. We'll leave that out. Number seven. He then talks about someone who's incarcerated, okay? If it's permissible or if it's lawful for him to have conjugal visits, for his wives to come to where he's locked up and be with him, then it's upon him to give them equal amount of visits. And this goes to show you how deep, how technical the fiqh of Islam is. Nothing is left out. And the scholars of fiqh, they didn't leave anything out for questioning and for confusion. Whatever was uh, possible to happen, they spoke about it. And they gave a detailed system of what to do and what not to do. Someone who's mad, he has more than one wife, he goes crazy. Someone who's young, let's say he gets married at a young age, his father marries him off, whatever the case may be. We all have rulings on this. He then says, um, number eight, تطيق الوطن أنه لا قسم للرجعية وجوب القسم للمعتدة من وطن بشبهة. He then mentions uh, the eighth point here. He says يق يقسم لكل زوجة تطيق الوطن. He says that every woman who has the ability to have sexual intercourse, then she deserves a night. In other words, if he marries a girl and for one reason or another she cannot have sexual intercourse, then it is not the same ruling of the ob obligation of having a specific night. Number nine, he says here that there is no splitting of nights, no sharing of nights. He says, For a woman who's, he says, here, we're going to stop here. Whereas uh, we have several, several, several more points and we don't want to give too much information in one session. So, we stopped here at point nine and we will go to point nine, point ten in our third session of this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. We ask him, the mighty and the majestic, to give us understanding of religion uh, and uh, firmness upon it. Amin. Uh, until the next session, if there are any questions, comments, concerns, something that you want to add, or whatever the case may be, please don't feel shy to post them so that way we can service you. And Allah Azawajal surely knows best. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Until the next part. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.